When Humphrey Repton arrived in Leeds during the autumn of 1809, to consult the two prospective commercial patrons, he found the Monumental Fund had just got underway. This was a public subscription to commission a monument from the sculptor John Flaxman for the parish church to commemorate two officers who had been killed that summer at the Battle of Talavera outside Madrid. Captain Samuel Walker and Captain Richard Beckett were the sons of leading commercial families. Repton's prospective clients were already subscribers. The Great War against France matched the length of Repton's career as a landscape gardener. Challenged by economic vicissitudes throughout, it is a tribute to Repton's imagination, work ethic and self-promotion that he sustained a career at all. In later life, he took the view that the war had destroyed his profession. He especially blamed the diminishing of his own income on the swinging war taxes, which he also considered were responsible for reducing the ability of his preferred aristocratic and gentry clientele to sustain its patronage of landscape gardening. Moreover, in his final publication, Fragments on the Theory and Practice of Landscape Gardening, 1816, and in his posthumously published memoirs, he relished disparaging the commercial sources of the new money that enriched his middle-class patrons. Arguably, it was this clientele that saved his career and enabled him to sustain a living amidst the hardships of wartime inflation and taxes. Yet, he seemed to delight in alleging that these clients were tarnished as war profiteers because their wealth was a consequence either of government contracts or financial speculation. This unexpected prejudice came as a surprise to Karen Lynch and myself during our research into Repton's nine Yorkshire commissions. In the course of the 20 years between 1790 and 1810, his patronage appears to have progressed from old to new money. Up to 1806, he created five red books for Portland Whigs, both aristocratic and gentry, as well as two for Tory aristocrats. Then in 1810, he created another two for middle-class commercial patrons. However, when Karen and I considered the source of the income of his old money patrons, it became clear that only one, Earl Fitzwilliam at Wentworth Woodhouse, could be described as genuinely old money, whose wealth derived from land ownership. The other six were all upwardly mobile, recently gentrified or elevated into the aristocracy, with incomes derived from working in the law, commerce and the military. All, to some degree, would warrant Repton's rather vague description of war profiteer. Incidentally, Langold Hall is a new addition to Repton's canon and was brought into the arena by the research of Karen Lynch. Among the Yorkshire commissions, the most dramatic example of landed patron as war profiteer was Edward Lassell's who was created second Baron Harwood in 1796 and in 1812, would be further elevated as first Earl of Harwood. Characteristically, when discussing Harwood in his memoirs, Repton refrained from reiterating the public knowledge that the source of the aristocrat's vast wealth was the Atlantic slave economy. It was also characteristic of Repton to reserve his polemic for the commercial patrons, who were represented in Yorkshire by two of the self-styled gentlemen merchants of Leeds, namely the merchant banker, John Blades II at Alton Hall, and the textile manufacturer, Benjamin Gott, at Armley House. Another characteristic was that the design consultant's proposals for all three places demonstrate that Repton behaved as a consummate professional in response to his client's requirements. However, Repton's attitude to all three highlights his contradictory perception. On the one hand, he celebrated the hospitality of the slave-owning Lord Harwood. On the other, 
the art collecting manufacturer, Benjamin Gott, seems to have confounded his prejudice against commercial patrons, while the banker, John Blades, appears to have become the subject of his scathing censure. It is the political and commercial alliance between urban and county Tory Anglicans that brings Harwood, Alton and Armley much closer together than expected. Moreover, despite his prejudice against new money, the only folio-sized red books were created for Blades and Gott. These are twice the size of the standard quarto size bestowed on his earlier clients. The exception was the red book for Harwood House, which took the form of a bound collection of architectural drawings similar in size to those for Armley and Alton. Perhaps coincidentally, the folio size signified the importance to Repton of these war profiteers. Harwood exemplifies the way that improvement through investment of commercial wealth in land, agriculture and conspicuous display ensured the elevation of a gentry merchant family into the aristocracy. Harwood also exemplifies the way that this process was financed through the adroit cultural laundering of wealth derived from the Atlantic slave economy. The business empire of the Lascelles encompassed the Atlantic world of Great Britain, West Africa, North America, and the British Caribbean islands. These islands were on the front line of the imperial conflict with France. Yet the Lascelles' wealth was undiminished by the depredations of naval and military campaigns. Indeed, their commercial enterprises were stimulated by the war. For example, the merchant ships of Liverpool and London businesses plying the triangular trade continued to be underwritten by the Lessels, who also continued to service the financial, material and defence requirements of British plantation owners. However, these lucrative contracts were largely overlooked because the major and highly controversial issue of the day was abolition of the British slave trade. A quarter of Lord Harwood's wealth was invested in slavery, and a third of his income came from his Caribbean profits. He owned almost 3,000 slaves who laboured on his 24 sugar plantations in the islands of Barbados, Jamaica, Grenada, and Tobago. These plantations were worth almost £300,000, which has been calculated as £28.3 million today. By 1800, the normality of the Atlantic slave trade had begun to be challenged as the campaign for abolition gathered momentum. Thus, the irony of Repton's 1802 visit to Harwood was that he enjoyed the company of the two Yorkshire MPs, Henry Lassells, the future second Earl, and William Wilberforce. The former was the heir to arguably the greatest fortune made in the slave economy. The latter was the anti-slavery politician who, in 1807, would be responsible for the successful passage of the Act for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Due to the elite status of his patron, Repton later chose in his memoirs to recollect Lord Harwood's hospitality and even to admonish the aristocrat for failing to adopt his proposals. He chose not to re recollect the source of his client's income. As this was publicly known, the abolitionists capitalised on it during the 1807 county election and emphasised the additional wealth the Lords of Harwood would receive if the slave trade was to continue. Needless to say, William Wilberforce was elected at the expense of Henry Lassells. His fellow and newly elected MP was the Whig candidate Lord Milton, the eldest son of Earl Fitzwilliam of Wentworth Woodhouse. Repton lamented that many of the old landed families were forced to sell their estates to the entrepreneurs he tended to describe as nouveau riche war profiteers. He wrote in his memoirs that, I have seen upstart wealth trampling 
over all I had been accustomed to look up to with respect. He complained about the ascendancy of these bourgeois arrivistes, who he was obliged to accept as clients. And he developed a censorious comparison between the cultural refinements he saluted in, he valued in ancient families and the vulgarity of those who gained wealth, quote, by industry of fortunate speculations. He also claimed to be horrified by the vision of gaudy villas springing up in the neighborhood of large manufacturing towns. Yet he acknowledged in fragments that it was these suburban villas that, quote, have of late had the greatest claim on my attention. Nonetheless, it must be emphasized that as a professional in need of an income, Repton suppressed his prejudices and conscientiously formulated proposals that would create an estate befitting the gentleman merchant in the pastoral hinterland of a manufacturing town. Given the importance of his two Leeds commissions, it is surprising that Repton omitted any subsequent recollection of Armley House. One is left to wonder whether he found the task for the textile entrepreneur so alienating that he considered it best to draw a veil of silence over the commission. However, the evidence of the Red Book for Armley House indicates that Repton regarded Benjamin Gott as an anomaly among his commercial patrons. When Repton stayed with Gott in his Leeds townhouse, he might have been surprised to find his clients surrounded with all the fashionable accoutrements of a cultural lifestyle appropriate to a connoisseurial art collector. Gott favoured Flemish and Italian landscape paintings, as well as works by contemporary British artists and sculptors. He was also renowned for his library, which embraced books on landscape gardening, including those by Repton. Sketches and Hints of 1795, Observations of 1803, Pavilion at Brighton, 1808, and later, after the Repton Commission, Fragments of 1816. As Gott was such an enthusiast of landscape art and civic culture, and because of Repton's own aesthetic preferences, the design consultant may well have felt appalled by the industrialised vistas that the topography of Armley House obliged him to propose to his clients in the Red Book. Writing in fragments, Repton was emphatic that, quote, the essential characteristic of a villa near the metropolis consists of its seclusion and privacy. Although these criteria were successfully achieved for blades at Oulton Hall, they were compromised for Repton by the elevated landform of Armley House. Even though his proposed panorama stair, as he called it, dramatically encompassed Gott's manufacturing empire. On occasions, Repton included quotations from English and Latin poetry in his red books in order to complement a client's erudition. Surprisingly, the Yorkshire volume was the most was the one for Benjamin Gott. Between the classical and contemporary, the Red Book for Armley House contains more literary quotations than any of its peers. Earl Fitzwilliam's Red Book for Wentworth Woodhouse is graced only with acknowledged extracts from William Mason's The English Garden and John Milton's L'Allegro, while the one for Brian Cook of Alston Hall includes the single favoured phrase from Walpole's History of Modern Taste in Gardening, which hails Milton for the prophetic eye of taste. The other extant Yorkshire Red books are devoid of these learned flourishes, even the one created almost simultaneously for Gott's friend, John Blades, at Alton Hall. However, for Gott, Repton chose to include a couple of Latin quotations unattributed, as well as an arcane and similarly unattributed literary reference. With the first Latin quotation selected from Ovid's Metamorphosis, Repton, almost with a nod and a wink, 
qualified the unsightly industrial features he proposed to conceal. Vix ea nostra voco, which translates as, I can scarcely call these things our own. Later, he drew upon another Roman author, Publilius Cyrus, to conclude his discussion of the interior of the house with the quip, malum confilium quod non mutari potest, meaning it's a bad plan that can't be changed. It is also intriguing that the consultant chose to share with a commercial patron a reference to a literary squib against his old adversaries of the picturesque controversy, Richard Payne Knight and Uvdell Price, as he had earlier with Earl Fitzwilliam, his preferred aristocratic client in the Red Book for Wentworth Woodhouse. Through these gestures, Repton would appear to have acknowledged that the connoisseurship of the textile manufacturer did not correspond with his perception of a commercial patron, let alone a war profiteer. Repton also exposed his contradictions in fragments. Fragment 16 includes his report concerning a villa near a common in the north of England. The prose of this report proved to be the most problematic of all the Repton texts consulted by Karen and myself. Repton's intention seems to have been to acknowledge that, on occasions, he chose to compliment anonymously patrons who had realized his proposals, and that, to exemplify this achievement, he had selected John Blades of Alton Hall. Blades was a partner in Beckett's Bank, which provided financial services to government contractors, such as Benjamin Gott and John Marshall. While Marshall's mill spun flax to make rope and sails for the Navy, Gott's mills wove cloth to produce blankets and uniforms for the army. Judging by Repton's retrospective comments, Blades satisfactorily implemented the proposals for Alton Hall. Blades' achievement has also been corroborated by archive sources, as Karen explains in our book. All bar one of the proposals were realised, which is substantially more than many clients achieved. Although Repton chose not to name either the place or the patron, he identified this nameless specimen of improvement in the north of England by including a pair of colour illustrations of a common improved in Yorkshire in the familiar before and after manner. These reproduced the scene from the Red Book for Alton Hall that he described in his report. Repton recorded that he had been engaged with the improvement of a villa placed on the edge of a goose common, which commanded a view of distant country, enriched with woods and gentlemen's seats. But the leading feature of the landscape was a row of mean tenements. He went on to recall that his proposals demonstrated, quote, the advantage taken of an act of parliament to enclose a common where the water, which stood in several small pools, was collected into an apparent river, and the road, with all the unsightly objects, is now become a line of plantation, forming a pleasing foreground to the richly wooded distance. Yet, strangely enough, the way these remarks were framed created the impression that Blades was the subject of Repton's scathing denunciation for the tasteless extravagance with which a client had failed to realize a red book. Whether intentional or not, Repton ambiguously conflated praise for the implementer and censure for the non-implementer. It's as though he couldn't resist the opportunity to demean his commercial patrons and it's tempting to regard these recollections as a further generalized complaint about those whom he described in his memoirs as the nameless nouveau riche with whom I have had transactions. 
Humphrey Repton was a self-made professional consultant who successfully sold his commercial services. It continues to remain a contradiction that he was persistent in disparaging an urban clientele enriched by entrepreneurial commerce. Perhaps the greatest irony of all is that Repton chose to ignore that he too was a businessman, though he was certainly not in the same league as Lassell's, Blades and Gott. Thank you. <laughs>